everyone. Welcome to the Nazio NEROC DER Integration and Compensation Initiative webinar. I'll give people just a second to trickle in before I kick start things off. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kristen Verklas. I'm a Senior Managing Director at Nazio, the National Association of State Energy Officials. And we are very excited to do this webinar with our partners at NEROC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Um, we, uh, both of our organizations, um, have a DR integration and compensation initiative, and this webinar is part of that. Uh, the webinar today will focus on grid modernization strategies to accelerate deployment of distributed energy resources, or DERs. Um, next slide, please. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot on what the uh, NASIO NARUC DR integration and compensation initiative is. Um, it's an effort that got kicked off about a year ago. Um, we are supporting our members to understand the impact of their decision making related to the connection operation and compensation of DERs within the distribution grid, the bulk power system, and wholesale energy markets. Um, we are providing information tools, um, such as this webinar, access to experts, and peer sharing opportunities to assist our members, not just with FERC Order 2222 implementations in the RTO and ISO regions, but also generally state oversight of transmission distribution and customer coordination for those of our members who are outside of the RTO ISO regions. We are guided by our members. Um, 10 NIRUC and NASIO members are part of our advisory group. Um, and they represent really diverse regional perspectives. Um, and our objectives are really to inform key state decision makers to bring different perspectives to the table and raise and evaluate risks and opportunities of different decision options when it comes to the implementation of Fort Order 2222 or generally the state oversight of TDC coordination. And with that, next slide, please. I'm really excited to introduce to you our fabulous moderator, Alexandra Fisher, Policy Advisor at the Public Service Commission of the District of Columbia. And I'm excited to turn things over to her to introduce our speakers, Lisa Schwartz, Senior Policy Researcher and Strategic Advisor with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Paul Heitman, Manager of the Clean Energy Division at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. Thank you all three so much for joining us today. And I would also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Office of Electricity at the Department of Energy, who uh, generously funds not just this webinar, but also the initiative. Um, over to you, Alex. Great. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And uh, thanks to both Nazio and Nehruk. Um, we're really excited today to have these two experts with us to discuss grid modernization. Um, first, we'll hear from Lisa Schwartz. Lisa is a senior policy researcher and strategic advisor for the Lawrence Berkeley Labs Electricity Markets and Policy Department. She leads training, technical assistance, and research for states on integrated distribution system planning, as well as broader topics on distributed energy resources and utility regulation. She also serves as the technical director for the Berkeley Labs Future Electric Utility Regulation Report Series, tapping leading thinkers to provide multiple perspectives on complex regulatory issues for the electricity sector to inform ongoing discussion and debate. Lisa has also worked previously as director of the Oregon Department of Energy, a senior associate at the Regulatory Assistance Project, and led resource planning and procurement for the Oregon Public Utility Commission. Then next, we'll hear from Paul Heitman. Paul has a long career contributing to many innovative programs, initially in telecom and then the power and energy industries, including transportation electrification. He has been involved with several key IEEE programs for standards development in the distributed energy space. Paul currently serves as program management lead for the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities Grid Modernization Program and has been working to develop a collaborative, equitable, and participative solution for interconnection reform that will help enable achievement of New Jersey's aggressive clean energy goals. Um, each of our speakers will go for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to Q&A. So to the audience members, um, if you could submit your questions into the Q&A box that you see down below, I will field those um, when we get to that portion of our um, discussion. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Alex. I'm Lisa Schwartz with Berkeley Lab. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about how to accelerate deployment of distributed energy resources through distribution and grid mod planning. Let's go to slide three. I wanted to first cover briefly the different types of distribution system plans that you hear about. 
for electric utilities. And I'm categorizing them here from you know, more narrow scopes to wider scopes as we go down the list. So first, some states have a transmission and distribution system improvement plan or something like that. And, and it's typically, you know, through law, uh, the state has allowed a utility to request expedited cost recovery for certain kinds of electricity system improvements. And an example of this is in Indiana, where they have an infrastructure improvement charge for TND as well as storage investments. Uh, moving on, uh, some states are focused explicitly on distribution planning, uh, as in Nevada, where there's a law that requires the utilities to evaluate the benefits and costs of distributed resources and look for ways to increase their cost effective deployment and improve their integration in distribution systems. A lot of states have uh, promulgated requirements for grid modernization planning. And U.S. Department of Energy and the National Labs would look at that as a reasoned strategy that links a proposed technology deployment roadmap to stated objectives. And that may include, uh, by law, it might include requests for regulatory approval of specific grid mod investments and programs. An example of that is a recent law that was passed in New Mexico. And a lot of utilities are filing grid mod plans on their own motion as well. Uh, particularly in the Southwest, we've seen a lot of these plans because there's, some of these investments are large and they're looking to get some kind of feedback from the commission uh, before they make these uh, big investments. And finally, uh, looking at the sort of the broadest lens here is integrated distribution system planning. And that provides a systematic approach to satisfy customer service expectations, as well as the state's grid planning and design objectives. And that can include things like integration and use of distributed resources, um, for sure, and grid modernization. And many, many states have, uh, you know, we have, you know, a, a lot of states now that have these requirements. And in some states, vertically integrated states, um, you might have coordination with both power system planning. An example of that is Hawaii. Uh, and in other states, they're attempting to coordinate planning across TND systems. An example there would be New York. And there are a lot of other types of plans that feed in and are in, in turn informed by distribution plans, things like transmission planning, electrification planning, the energy security plans that the states have been producing, and demand side management plans. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, but it's important. It, uh, my colleague, Paul D. Martini, who I've been working with um, for a long time, uh, have, has this is his latest iteration. And this is looking at how the distribution system may evolve based specifically on adoption of distributed energy resources. So starting at the bottom at stage one, you've got low adoption of distributed energy resources. And he defines that as the distributed uh, generation capacity, you know, less than 5% of distribution system peak. And at that point, the, the, that, that level can be handled within existing distribution systems without big changes to infrastructure, to planning or operations. But then when you move up to, to stage two and you've got more uh, higher levels, five to 20% um, of, of distributed generations at, at system peak, and, and you're beginning to use distributed resources for wholesale and distribution services, both individually and aggregations, you know, then you uh, you begin to need to observe operation of distributed resources in real time and be able to monitor monitor their use and 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 in some cases be able to operate them and control them, um, and that's stage two. And you've got also sort of moderate levels of of transportation electrification, building electrification at that stage. But then at stage three, at the very top, you've got really high levels. Of, of distributed energy resource adoption over 20% of the system peak. And you're beginning to use uh, the DERs uh, more and more for wholesale and distribution services. And they're also community microgrids. So think about DER aggregations as virtual power plants that are optimized to support the grid service requirements for both transmission and distribution systems. And you've got also microgrids to help support local energy supply and resilience. Um, and the dream is ultimately you have distribution system level energy transactions. So at this stage, you know, that level of use of distributed resources requires coordination across jurisdictions. And that's what 
for quarter 22, 22 anticipates. And you also need the infrastructure to support both grid and market operations. Next slide, please. So considering that evolution and some, some of it's um, not orderly uh, and it can happen quicker than we think, it's a good idea to consider proactive planning. And so this is really tell, telling uh, utility customers, where does the grid need help? What services does the grid need? And then provide the appropriate incentives so that customers can help meet these needs. So some of the analyses that are really critical here are forecasting distributed energy resources to help distribution system planners avoid potential overbuilding of the system, and, and also to analyze which feeders might be most stressed by distributed resources. Hosting capacity, that's the amount of distributed resources, typically it's PV at this point, that can be interconnected without adversely affecting power quality or reliability under existing control and protection systems and, and without the need for major infrastructure upgrades. So together, these two processes can identify feeders that are likely to see growth of distributed resources. And those, those feeders can be considered for proactive upgrades. Uh, you also have non-wires alternatives uh, analysis. And, and these are distributed resources of all kinds that can provide specific services at specific locations on the grid to defer a subset of traditional infrastructure investments. And they can leverage customer and third-party capital. So not all of these costs are in ratepayers. And finally, just to try to think more systematically in distribution planning about locational net benefits analysis, that systematically analyzing the costs and benefits that distributed resources can provide for a given place on the distribution system and what are the net benefits. And you can begin to use these analyses to inform retail rates and tariffs programs for distributed energy resources. Uh, for example, geo-targeting. Um, and I've got some extra slides in the back that are useful in that regard. Next slide. So Nancy asked me to sort of identify some state trends for accelerating the deployment of distributed resources through distribution and grid modernization planning. Well, uh, first and most simply, more and more states are establishing planning requirements for distributed resources, um, distribution systems and grid modernization, either by legislation or regulation. And that clearly includes planning to accelerate grid modernization and distributed energy resource deployment. And we recently looked across all of the uh, states that have got requirements and what were their objectives? Why did they say that they were promulgating these requirements? And what we found was really common was uh, objectives that really relate specifically or, or generally to distributed energy resources, you know, most specifically to directly support DER integration and use for grid services, but also to increase customer choice, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and support a clean energy transition, to improve grid resilience through microgrids, through solar plus storage, through demand flexibility, and simply to accelerate deployment of new technologies and services for best grid performance and to try to keep down electricity system costs. So there are a host of state requirements that can accelerate deployment of distributed resources. So I'll talk about the, the analyses related directly to distributed energy resources uh, in the next two slides. Um, but also there's an increasing trend toward trying to bring together planning across full power and distribution systems. And I've included a link here to Hawaiian Electric's draft 2023 integrated grid plan to give you a, a picture for what that can look like. There's also trying to align for in vertically integrated states, integrated resource planning and distribution system planning, including, for example, forecasts of distributed energy resources. Uh, Minnesota, for example, in its June order included a, a several requirements in this regard. Also trying to link better integration of electrification planning. So this could be for both transportation and buildings with planning for distributed energy resources or distribution planning. Nevada and, and Minnesota uh, included links here for example, regulations related to that. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, there uh, ex expedited cost recovery for grid mod investments 
to support higher DER deployment levels. And you see that in several states. Examples include New Mexico, Illinois, Minnesota, and Indiana. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna uh, focus just uh, at a high level on these next two slides on the very specific DER related distribution planning elements. Um, first and foremost, forecasting distributed resources. So the different types of DERs, the sizes, the amounts and locations. Um, here I've got a picture of my 25 kilowatt solar PV system on our farm in Oregon. I never would have thought we would have put a system in that large until a couple of years ago when costs really came down. Hosting capacity analysis. Um, these are maps typically that show where interconnection costs will be relatively low or high. And they're supporting data, spreadsheets that provide details. They're used uh, for uh, to guide developers to where it may be lower or higher cost or take less or more time to get through the interconnection process. They can be used for uh, interconnection screens to determine whether or not a, a proposed interconnection has to go through more detailed studies. And they can also be used in distribution system planning, as I'll we'll talk about. And then uh, fundamentally, uh, the utility is developing its uh, grid needs assessment is identifying the anticipated and existing capacity deficiencies and constraints and how they're going to solve these either through traditional utility mitigation projects or there's a subset of these planned projects that may be suitable for non-wires alternatives. These are distributed resources that could potentially defer or avoid infrastructure upgrades for different kinds of system needs. Next slide. And here are a few more distribution planning elements that are DER related. Uh, one of my favorites is just take your existing programs, energy efficiency, demand flexibility, what have you, and, and think about geo-targeting them. That is directing them to meet very specific, uh, location specific and time dependent distribution system needs. The graph here shows uh, an example of some measures that were used to target distribution needs in two communities in Excel Energy's Minnesota service area. Certainly we would expect to see a grid modernization strategy and technology roadmap. Uh, that asterisk refers to a roadmap that's in the extra slides in the back. Um, and that includes investments that may be needed to integrate, monitor, and use distributed resources for grid services. And then we often see proposals for pilots. These could be things like uh, resilience projects, solar plus storage, microgrids, time bearing pricing, for example, for managed EV charging. Next slide. Uh, hosting capacity is another major uh, set of analyses in utility plans. And uh, here from the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, we show that there are 16 states plus the District of Columbia, Columbia that require regulated utilities to file hosting capacity analysis. And you can click on these links to see example hosting capacity maps around the country. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, point out California's uh, integration capacity analysis is what they call their hosting capacity analysis because they include more than just distributed resources. They include pretty much everything. And that, and that includes new loads like EV charging. And the reason that's important, um, it's, it's especially important in the context of state electrification initiatives, as well as storage, which can serve as load when they're charging, and they can serve as generation when they're discharging. And, and some of these distributed energy resources can actually increase hosting capacity analysis. So that's important to consider as well. So the commission um, has, in California, directed utilities uh, to do major refinements for their maps, and then they have, they have great data portals that are consistent across all of the utilities. So if you're a developer, it's far easier for you to get the information you need uh, to, to develop uh, projects across a state in different utility territories. And the, the other good thing about these data portals is that they actually include um, not just the hosting capacity analysis information, but also the opportunities to use distributed resources as non-wires alternatives, what they call their distribution deferral opportunity report. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to briefly touch on non-wires alternatives. We talked about, you know, the different ways that they can be used, load relief and so forth, and, and you know, the potential to reduce utility costs. 
Um, in terms of procedurally, typically the utilities issue a competitive solicitation for very specific system needs, and they compare these bids to the utilities planned investment to try to determine the lowest reasonable cost solution. There are over 10 jurisdictions that now require this consideration and other states have proceedings or pilots or studies underway. And um, you may be interested in the report that's referenced at the bottom of the slide on locational value of distributed energy resources. And we talk about the, the decades long history of non-wires alternatives in the country, both for transmission and distribution. Next slide. Um, I, I wanted to include this California example um, just because they have been working on this for decades. And while they do have some successful non-wires alternative projects, um, I would say it's not been wildly successful. So commission staff proposed two pilots um, to try to get at this problem, um, which, uh, you know, I, I, trying to come up with standard contract terms so that you're only bidding prices in the auction, that's a really simple way to do it. And also pre-screening distributed energy resource aggregators. So that process is done and then the process can be uh, smoother and, and accelerated on a first come first serve basis. And there's more information on this in extra slides. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna close here with a couple of slides briefly on planning challenges that we see with respect to distribution planning and distributed energy resources. So certainly forecasting is a big challenge. You've got to take, you know, typically system-wide forecasts and allocate them down to specific substations and feeders. Um, you, you're also wanting to uh, take into account, you know, the impacts of your programs for distributed energy resources on specific aspects of the uh, specific areas of the distribution system. And new is incorporating new forecasts of, of electric vehicle charging. Um, also, um, it's helpful uh, to disaggregate the load forecast. So this is on the load side. So you can identify trends in the individual end uses, you know, water heating, space heating, what have you. And then that makes it easier to assess the impacts of distributed resources they may have on those particular end use load profiles. So I don't wanna just leave you with challenges. I wanna give you some of the solutions. So I wanna highlight that um, National Renewable Energy Lab has published recently end use load profiles, uh, and we provided some materials at Berkeley Lab to help people use them. There are customer adoption models that have been used for a while that do a good job of trying to account for impacts uh, of, of all kinds of different things, incentive, retail rates, and so forth, um, on the propensity of customers to adopt distributed resources. You can benchmark against third-party DER forecasts. You can conduct pr probabilistic forecasts, as you know, your, your point forecast won't be right. Um, and certainly using scenarios, what would be the impact of electric, electrification or high levels of PV and storage? Um, for hosting capacity analysis, some of the challenges include costs, um, accuracy. Uh, typically, again, uh, we've seen almost everywhere, it's just uh, distributed PV photovoltaics that are included, not other DERs. Um, and that's important to, to make that leap. Often electrification is not considered, um, and it should be. And uh, sometimes the utilities raise issues around uh, cyber and physical security and want to redact data. Next slide, please. Um, a few more planning challenges. Uh, some states are beginning to work on proactive upgrades to increase hosting capacity where they know they don't have enough, won't have enough, considering uh, existing constraints and predicted levels or known levels. Of, of distributed energy resources. And cost allocation obviously is a big challenge there. Um, Non-wires alternatives, I mentioned some of the solutions there, but you know, generally we've seen in some cases utilities don't have enough viable bids to meet the utility's full need for any particular deferral opportunity. So you know, they don't have enough, then they have to go with the traditional uh, investment uh, long lead times. And that's where some of the California pilots are, are trying to make progress. And also often the non-wires alternatives don't pass the cost benefit test. And so few are selected, but there are examples of successful projects and I, you can uh, read the resources listed here to see and read about them. Um, and here in the table, Excel Energy worked with stakeholders to propose changes to its process uh, that they hope will yield better results in the future. Next slide. 
So I think this is my final slide. I just wanted to uh, let folks know about a catalog of state distribution planning requirements that Berkeley Lab is producing this spring and later this year with Pacific Northwest National Labs. We're going to be updating our uh, the work that we've done in reports and presentations over the years on sort of what are the what's the current state, and there'll be all kinds of information in there, um, general information, uh, procedural requirements, substantive requirements, and it'll all be posted on our distribution planning website. Uh, and finally, I, Berkeley Labs working with uh, NASIO on ways that state energy offices are engaging in distribution planning. Next slide. So here are some resources for more information, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Paul now and um, questions, keep bringing the questions in and we'll address them um, after uh, Paul is done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, let me just pull up my slideshow. And good. Okay, can everyone see? Yep, that looks great. Okay. So I borrowed the opening slide from NASIO, and I'll quickly move on to our version of, uh, of this, uh, which is New Jersey's grid modernization. And uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I will later mention the help that Lisa and her team has been giving us, including Paul DiMartini, uh, with some of our work. But uh, first, I want to set the context of what we're trying to do. And this is sort of taking the tactical approach to reducing friction so that more DER can be attached and opening up opportunities to compensate it within the, uh, within the current EDC. So I would propose, I know non-wires alternative is a, is a, and at least he triggered a great thought. We almost, alternative implies either or, it's almost like we wanna do wires investment optimization. So WIO, we'll, we'll maybe propose a new acronym. <laughs> Uh, so we want to allow that, but we really want to do it in an intelligent way. So here's what's forcing us, rightly so. Uh, we have a very proactive governor, as a lot of you probably know, and a lot of you probably have as well. Uh, so we've got an energy master plan that was commissioned by the governor and launched. Uh, we're rewriting that coming up next year, too. And we've got a proactive legislator too, legislature, too. So these are what's driving our division, which is the clean energy division at the Board of Public Utilities. And the mechanism for implementing this is modifying our interconnection rules, which are New Jersey Administrative Code 14 colon 8 dash 5. We'll more about that later. So <clears throat> we've commissioned a, a research and we've had a stakeholder proceeding underway for about a year, year and a half. A guidehouse was, was our uh, consultant. And basically they published a report with nine recommendations. It was accepted by our board and it kind of fell into two action paths. Near term where we can immediately implement rules which were underway. We'll talk about those a little bit later. And then longer term, but longer, probably not in the Demartini slide of 2035 and you'll see why, more like 2027. Um, what used to be considered, you know, next uh, two years from now was long term. Uh, we, we have to get moving on this, and you'll see why, because these are the drivers that are pushing us for this. Uh, we've got a very aggressive already uh, energy efficiency program that is evolving even to include, you know, demand response type mechanisms. Well, part of the view here is efficiency and clean energy, distributed clean energy, uh, follows the same path. We have to be efficient. It's We need it to meet our climate goals. And also we have to be equitable. It has to be distributed properly. It has to uh, serve underserved communities. And there's a lot of uh, moving past business as usual in deploying this. So there's a couple of things that have been pushing us. There's three sort of domains. Again, everybody on this call is probably very familiar with technology changes that are driving it, uh, financial impacts and implications, and then business models that are emerging, uh, including possibly you know using electric vehicles as a service, et cetera. So I'd like to dive in a little bit about on the technology side. I have a kind of a standard big picture slide here. And the points I want to make are there there's a lot of um, change happening both 
you know, at the bulk side of generation, we all know coal is being withdrawn and, you know, some grid scale solar is being put up. Nuclear is sort of holding its own, uh, maybe moving to modular nuclear, but all of those are shifting opportunities at the right side, which is the distributed energy resource. And even some of the technologies at the point of interconnection, at the meter to the you know different segments, uh, are being implemented with smart meters, AMI, and smart inverters. That's a, a point of common coupling and a technology that can be used. Also, uh, we, uh, Lisa mentioned aggregation as a possible tool. That's the FERC order twenty two twenty two that is that is coming. That's uh, trying to leverage these technologies, smart smart meters, et cetera, and deal with sort of the decentralized control that's rapidly evolving. And along with that decentralized control, you're starting to see a lot of overlap with the wholesale side and uh, where there's ISOs and the retail side. Um, the opportunity to aggregate, for example, the aggregation box there, uh, pulling a lot of these, herding a lot of these cats and delivering services back up to the centralized market. So those are technology technology changes. Our energy master plan has had seven specific strategies that were outlined. Uh, two of them directly apply to what we're doing with grid modernization. And those are uh, accelerating the deployment of renewable energy and DER. And to do that, we've got to remove friction and make it easier for people to put this in. And also to decarbonize and modernize New Jersey's energy system. So that underpins the two primary strategies. And looking at the executive influence and requests and requirements, uh, we go back about five years now. As I said, you know, there was an executive order that launched this energy master plan. It was released in 2019. And that was kind of pretty aggressive to say by 2050, we'd be at 100% clean energy. You know, all the states are leapfrogging in, in a race, rightly so, to get this done sooner rather than later. And just a couple of months ago, uh, our governor, you know, doubled down on himself and said, we got to meet this target by 2035. So you can see there's a lot of, this is a lot of executive pressure. And on the legislative side, in concordance with this, uh, they passed the Clean Energy Act. So the law really took a broad swipe at uh, opening up all these mechanisms to accelerate solar, to introduce energy storage, and all of these things have taken root and are coordinating and kind of falling under this domain of, of moving this forward under grid modernization. So that's sort of the theme of what the methods are that we've used here for grid mod in New Jersey. <clears throat> so first, uh, I'll just quickly go through a couple of conceptual slides about what is New Jersey grid mod, if you had to describe it. There's four words. First, incremental. Now you look at the time frames, uh, it's incremental, but it's not, let's take a long time to do this. So if you remember Paul Martini's slide from Lisa's presentation, there was sort of a center line that was right around 2027. 20, and what, Lisa was at stage two, I think he viewed, and some of stage three uh, with the full stage three kicking in by 2035. So, you know, we, we basically view that the precondition of being able to do this or philosophically is that we have intelligent, aware, motivated customers. There's smart technology meters and inverters that uh, that are in place. Uh, the meters being the quality measurement and verification. Um, there's reasonable financing, notwithstanding what the Fed is doing right now. Hopefully that'll come and go quickly. Um, and that there's a compensation tool to to support investment. Well, the lowering of the friction is what we're doing immediately, and we'll, we'll go into a little more of that directly. That's what the, the rules uh, modifications that are in play right now. They've been released. We're waiting for stakeholder feedback on those. And that is really the low hanging fruit of this, which is to reduce the application processing uh, so things don't get hung up, move in quickly as possible to update and unify but not necessarily expand hosting capacity because the expansion of hosting capacity gets into a little more the longer term because uh, it costs money it disrupts things but at least making it consistent 
you know we have four edcs and uh, you know these immediate rule changes will at least make a lot of consistency and set it up for future automation of that process so that this hosting capacity information can be delivered to project developers right where they need it uh, there's also a big emphasis to move to proactive planning um, so and, and again lisa had sort of a concept of proactivity you know reactive is sort of what we're at now that are the current conditions uh, proactive is desirable predictive is where we want to get at when that's going to introduce things like artificial intelligence etc but philosophically that's where we want to go and then uh, long term we want to create and we've introduced this term called grid flexibility services so we want to make sure and maybe demand response falls under that you know everything that a distributed uh, resource can do or a building or anybody that has discretion over load uh, could fall under this grid flexibility service market. Uh, when these DERs connect, there usually is a pretty significant cost for upgrading parts of the grid. Uh, we recognize that that has to change because right now it's cost, cause, or pays. So we're looking at that and uh, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, we want to maximize in the long term, this is where we do want to grow grid host, hosting capacity uh, continually, not just hey, we did it and we're done. This has to just evolve and grow continuously and intelligently. Uh, along the lines is a really important part of energy storage. We have a program for that. We've launched storage incentive program. And then the idea of, of an EDC similar to what they're doing in California, sort of having a tariff that describes if, if it's a, maybe if it's a microgrid, but certainly for DER participation. Uh, sort of getting it into the mainstream. And if we do all that, I think we will be doing highly cost-effective grid upgrades. So that's, you know, uh, wire maximization, wire investment uh, optimization. Um, we'll also be opening up many economic engines for not only building these systems and workforce needed for that, but also people making those investments and, and um, uh, driving revenue streams and et cetera to the edge of the grid. Uh, we, we'll, we'll be able to, when the FERC order 2222 comes in, it more easily stand up the, the aggregators that Lisa talked about so that they can play a meaningful role and participate. And, and they, they do the hard work of herding the cats and the utility now connects and the, and the wholesale market connects with them. So we're paving the way for that. Uh, we want it. We want to really drive towards a strong community based because this is at the edge of the grid and a, a market mechanism that's driving that investment and helping that grow. And part of that is is the idea of, of mitigating risk for private funding. There's a lot of barriers, as we know, uh, where funders look at the uncertainty of regulatory or, or technology in some cases, and and that's a difficult thing to overcome. So. This is an area of philosophically where we want to get to for our vision. Um, then lastly, you know, the ultimate, the idea of this flexible distribution grid, having these grid flexibility services. So, as I said, this is it. That was incremental. I spent a long time on that. I'll go through these next ones quickly. Uh, we want engagement. We want intelligent customers. This is a very much a customer centric uh, evolution or revolution. And, you know, more and more customers are aware of their opportunities uh, to self power. Uh, if there's a coordinated effort with ourselves as regulators, utilities, the municipalities, the finance community and these aggregators to educate and make available, they're going to make an investment decision. And what we want to focus on right now is that where those applications can be streamlined. So one of the things we're even looking at is using the permitting uh, application that NREL developed, Solar App Plus, as an upfront into that down, down the road. Again, more efficiency, lower friction. Uh, so that's the, that's the area on that. Now, how did we do this and, and where did we bring our consultant in? Obviously, there are huge barriers in, and misalignments, primarily with business models with reliability for the grid, et cetera. So our, our concept here right from the beginning was to 
recognize that there's our four EDCs and, you know, bring them to the table in the public forum, uh, along with some really key players that are driving the change, you know, non EDC developers and standard uh, setting agencies, etc. So a collaborative approach through all this was was what we tried to do. Um, now that's a lot of kumbaya and everybody's got their own interests, but we're trying to align it and we're also realistic with that. So what we tried to do and still do is to align as much as possible, build as much consensus as possible between all these disparate uh, stakeholder groups, uh, and, but realistically recognize that some of these things are just really difficult and will need to be politically resolved. So we're right up front about that. Um, and so far it's worked, I think, pretty well. There's no, there's general agreement and alignment with how we're doing this. So just a couple of quick things about, you know, who are the change agents? Us, the governor's office is really pushing this and customers, you know, we're empowering customers to, to do this. Um, what are the changes needed? New rules, as I mentioned, that's where we're headed, where we can expand this uh, connection capacity. Uh, when are they planned? Again, we're splitting it into immediate and then longer term, you know, to meet this aggressive goal of 2035, this advanced goal of 2035. Where are they needed? Where the changes happen? It's both front and behind the meter. So that's why I said, you know, wires investment optimization, because there's definitely going to be a role for that. But it's not just blindly poles and wires. It's opening up uh, services, you know, um, in conjunction with maybe uh, beefing up the distribution system. And of course, the why is we have to get significantly higher rates of clean energy attached for this. Uh, the how we already covered, you know, highly facilitated involvement. We have our consultant. We've just launched the, the Grid Modernization Forum. Talk a little bit of that in my last couple of minutes here. Uh, the rule change is a great mechanism because rules seem to draw attention, <laughs> uh, but you can't just bang the gavel and say, that's the rule. This has to be debated and vetted and the, the sensible things that give you immediate traction, we're putting those in place first uh, and we're, opening up the table for discussion to, you know, on these more sensitive ones. Um, and again, philosophically, we, we just need to be more proactive and then predictive uh, when they come with, the EDCs come with traditional infrastructure investment. Uh, this is gonna touch the utility planning process. That's the area that Lisa and her team have been very helpful uh, to us. Um, and maybe their business models. I don't know, many of these things are gonna be uh, changing. So just to summarize, incremental, engaging, collaborative, and realistic. That's the, the theme of our grid mod program. Uh, we, I don't have any of the same states that, that Lisa has, but, but I did want to show a couple of examples. Connecticut, their uh, public utility uh, agency is, is very innovative in many areas. Uh, one of them is they have a regulatory sandbox, formal regulatory sandbox program that we're really studying and looking to incorporate into our grid mod forum. So, so that's a great reference. They're also doing a lot of implementation work on this. Uh, everybody knows about New York Rev. They're taking very proactive actions, for example, directing state agencies to decarbonize. Um, that's just an example, obviously. They're doing a lot of things. Uh, Maryland is very progressive too with their PC44. They've had a very collaborative stakeholder you know input into all this that brought a lot of people together focusing on solar storage uh etc and then of course california you know they're they're moving to really uh you know uh, action oriented against their rule 21 and leveraging these der's so uh, so what we've done is reached out for some doe support and we're um uh, we have a couple of dimensions of that, uh, first of which we were enrolled as a peer group with uh, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Utah, kind of a strange mix, but all focused at interconnection reform. And Michael Ingram and David Naranga out at NREL were leading that. Also, we had PNNL um, involved in that. They're also helping us with the microgrid 
side of this. Um, so not, not all those states, they're helping just New Jersey on that. But, uh, and then of course, here's the shout out to Lisa and uh, under Joe Palladino down at the DOE headquarters and uh, Paul Martini as their key consultant um, has really been helping us. And I'll show you specifically where that has come in. So here's a reference I just wanted to give if, if you hadn't seen it, this was, it's almost a year old, but this was North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. Um, they issued the 50 states of grid modernization. And it's a very uh, dense tome, but it's very, this is the summary of it. What, if you wanna take action, what are the areas you should be uh, working in? So studies and investigations, uh, grid planning and market access, utility business model, rate reform. And these are uh, essentially work groups that we are standing up under our grid mod forum. And uh, I just wanted to show you this view and give you that reference so you can uh, take a read if you hadn't already. It's a great uh, primer and it's also a great framework to be working in. So our timeline started with engaging our four EDCs uh, actually setting it up with the right topics and presentations, asking the EDCs to come to the table with a very similar common presentation on these uh, areas. We also added or bolted on the PJM piece there thinking we would be uh, addressing this DER aggregation. That ended up becoming less important for the interconnection reform because the fact is you've got to, you have to inter interconnect in a qualified interconnection agreement before you can even be aggregated. So we, we just focused on the distribution side. Then in the spirit of equal access, we invited our group of uh, non-EDCs from a variety of areas, um, including workflow, process automation, uh, equipment, fuel cells you can see is there. Um, and we had another input. And we took all of that together. We took, we took our utilities, we took those and other folks, all the stakeholders, wrapped that all up along with some basic research with some of these really outstanding uh, enterprises and, uh, and referencing some benchmarking for other states. And Guidehouse pulled all this together and issued this set of recommendations. The first four of which are the rules that are underway and the set the last five of which are the formation of our work group uh you know, we're calling it the grid mod forum so i have uh do i have a couple more minutes left i will just yeah take a couple more you, which would you rather go to would you rather go to the future ones or the current rules that are uh in in play i guess that's uh, to kelsey or kirsten or alex like, as our moderator well, since no one else said anything, I'm going to pick the future. <laughs> Works for me. Okay, well, I'll keep going then. We'll talk about, these are the two paths. We have the direct rules evolution, and I'll pick the future-oriented ones first, so we can go through those. So these are the five work groups that we are standing up. Uh, Literally just yesterday, our board approved it and authorized the, the launch of this to move forward. And uh, so we're, we're implementing this way. We're standing up these recommendations uh, that came from the report that had been accepted by the board. And essentially five is shorthand for how do you take California Rule 21, leverage the IEEE 1547 uh, interconnection standard and create grid services, grid flexibility services, uh, put a tariff in place, et cetera. A lot of work in that, very focused at, uh, you know, mar how does it become market driven? Uh, recommendation six is how do you get uniformity into the cube management process? Uh, how do you streamline this? D does clustering work? Six is also tied with when you get groups that make sense to do together, can you use that as a signal to say the wires could be upgraded in this? That's a shortcut method to, to say we got enough people not just predicting like future. It's like these are real projects and real opportunities along a circuit that we might be able to go back to the substation and, and, and implement reverse power flow, for example. But that's the idea of, of in a more streamlined, logical way, how do you 
process and, and automate that process. Uh, seven is the, the idea of um, the cost allocation or reallocation. So obviously this, this gets into some political things, but it's, uh, we recognize it can't just be cost, cause, or pays because that stalls out too many opportunities. It's inefficient and, and we don't need to do that. So we have to look at ways to value resilience and all the classic kind of financial and then how do you and very importantly it's you know um uh, cost you know typically it's cost recovery and allocation yeah you know that that's the um or allocation of recovery in that order how does how do you allocate cost who pays and then how do you recover it usually on rate rate payers well this focus is moving it upstream to how do you estimate what's the estimate methodology for cost upgrade on distribution system is it is it proper and valid uh you know independently viewed this could be a non-wires alternative mechanism in here and then how do you verify that so it's it's the estimation estimation value validation and then uh um assignment and recovery that's the span of of uh, work group seven uh eight is what um uh, if, if anybody asks a question about eight, I will maybe turn it back over to Lisa. As I said, they've been helping us with this. This is getting a work group together to ask the right questions to the EDCs. And by the way, the EDCs are, will be participating on the work group um, about what we need in your integrated plan. It, not just here's the big lift for all the wires. It's very specifically, how does that plan um, establish the path to ever increasing hosting capacity so that's work group eight and then nine was we, we everybody probably has examples where you've got mixed if you have net energy metering there's some restrictions on non clean energy and we're calling those hybrid systems this is going to be probably touch a lot on net energy metering and energy storage and, and what have you so that is that is the future looking uh uh, work that we're standing up with our grid mod forum and then I won't go through the the specific rules but you can see that we're it, this is all online you can see we took the existing code and very specifically changed some language in, in, in a in a clear way to lower the friction and to and to make this more effective um, right on this first pass so these were the this is the green box early um, early work we're doing and we'll, so there's 13, we added a few sections too. Uh, you'll notice proactive uh, system upgrade planning was introduced, leading obviously into integrated DER plan that I just talked about. Um, we're introducing a pre-application process that we're letting some certain size uh, projects get a little early evaluation to decide is this even worth it or not, and a variety of other, other things. And then lastly, we, we have a lot of uh, adjacent programs. I think I mentioned before, a lot of these roll up into a modern grid at, at some point. So our AMI data proceeding, we have energy storage. Uh, we even have, we're participating in hydrogen fuel cell uh, task force and involved with this um, regional hydrogen hub. And then there's a whole bunch of EV charging, um, hopefully including some future vehicle to grid service. So with that, I will stop. We'll stop at the critical issues because that's the hard part. <laughs> but that, that'll tee up questions for the for the first part. I'm sure those will get touched on in the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for that really informative presentation. Um, we have a few Q and A in the in the box, so I'll start with those and um, you know keep them coming in. Um, so we had one question here, um, which is: Is it appropriate for DERs to pay distribution charges consistent with their use of the distribution system and the costs that they can cause or incur on the distribution system. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this, and I know this is a hot topic these days with what's going on in other states, such as California. So um, if I, if either of you wants to start with that one. I, I, I can opine. Um, you know, I, first of all, I want to say that these issues are typically not addressed in distribution system planning, this specific issue. 
um, of cost allocation, um, cost causer, they're typically addressed through the interconnection process and net metering or successor tariffs. Um, but typically it is the cost causer, the individual project developer that does pay for interconnection costs. And in some states, utilities are grouping projects in their interconnection queue so that developers can share costs. That's really an important development. Um, several states have developed successor tariffs to net metering to try to better reflect the cost of solar PV. But I just want to say it's also important to look at the potential benefits, especially when paired with storage. And some of these successor tariffs, our research at Berkeley Lab has shown, provide some kind of perverse incentives for using storage to benefit for the whole system. So it gets a little complicated. Yeah, and I, and I think um, that's great answer. And that's why we're trying to, as, as you saw, you know, we're those work groups I described are very interrelated. They're very task oriented. So the one that's focused at cost allocation and new models are going to be looking at, well, how does that affect the integrated plan of the, the utility? How does that leverage grid flexibility services from you know the tariff side? So it, that's not trivial work and it's, but it's important you know, to pose different, and above all of that, I mentioned Connecticut being the sandbox you know, uh, program we're hoping to identify new ways of doing it in limited scale and getting some data with that. So that that's going to be an important part of all the work groups who will have access to that mechanism to do these um, you know, rapid pilots. So ho hopefully that will that will help in the transition because we we can't just keep doing business as usual. That just doesn't work. Thanks for those answers, and we look forward to seeing the outcome of some of those pilots. On the subject, this segues us well into another question, which was about locational-based incentives for DERs. Um, and there's some concern that the other, that there are other market drivers, such as land availability and price, that actually have much more impact uh, on decision-making for developers than hosting capacity. And so that DER developers are kind of continuing to build projects in capacity constrained areas. Um, are there examples of locational based incentives for DERs that can overcome that are overcoming some of those other market drivers? Yeah, on, on, on slide eight in my, in my presentation, I showed a, sh a chart which is focused on an energy efficiency demand response, not solar PV, which you know is where this question is really going. But that's just an example of enhanced incentives that are used uh, to target, you know, in this case, it was two particular communities in Minnesota, uh, Excel Energy's Minnesota territory. But you certainly, um, there's an example at the back of my slide deck in extra slides that's PV specific. And that was, it's about New York's uh, successor net metering tariff, uh, the value stack tariff. Um, and that's compensating um, PV based on location in certain areas where they get you know, uh, additional values for being in those particular locations, as well as the other values they could provide for capacity, energy, you know, demand reduction. Right, and and of course the the ultimate is to just have a grid flexibility service tariff that pays what for whatever resource makes sense. And if you're land constrained, you can still have batteries participating. You can have your vehicles participating. That's the idea. And then an aggregator can just kind of collect all that, organize it and deliver it, you know, the, but I mean, it is a factor though. So the way it, it is now, there are parts that are constrained and there's no room to put anything. So. Uh, we, thank you. We also had a question about DERMS. Um, so looking for comment from either of you on utility investment in DERMS um, to better forecast DER even at a low level of DER adoption relative to load. Yeah, I am not a DERMS expert, um, but the way I think about it is, you know, that need for monitoring and potentially control comes once you get to, you know, more moderate levels or higher levels of distributed energy resources. Um, but because DERMS does enable the, so it's a de, it's distributed energy resource management systems, because it does enable observability of, of operation of, of distributed resources in real time, that certainly could support forecasting. Whether it's needed at a low level, I think that's where staff wants to do its due diligence. Yeah, I mean, that it, again, that's going to be a, a key topic on what, you know, we're hoping to see very clear DERMS arguments of 
functionality and everything in the integrated DER plan. I think even in our survey that we didn't we ask about the terms in, in our uh, yeah the survey we're sending out to 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 get the data in on what's the baseline of the for our utilities. Um, and in my grand vision of at the right hand side of that, you know, in 2027, <laughs> which kind of is tomorrow, um, you know, we we would have Derms is it very important, as Lisa said, for monitoring for status, you know, staying on top of how the grid, you know, is behaving. But there is a control aspect too, in the sense of sending the grid flexibility services signals out. And maybe it's through an open ADR connection to a top end node or something like that. I know different states are experimenting with different things, but but that's the, um, oh, bye Lisa. Uh, now I get all the tough questions because now, now Lisa's gone. But anyway, that's the idea is, is uh, DERMS has a role to play. It's not an automatic thing. It definitely is more needed when there's a higher deployment of it. But as as we said, our, our base assumption is we need higher density deployment and yesterday so to, to achieve our goals. So I see Kirsten is here. I was wondering if I could indulge one moderator's pr privilege question um, <laughs> while I still have you here, Paul. In yeah, sure. thinking about um, interconnection, I know some states have looked at doing automation, automated interconnection that is um, sort of encapsulated within an updated hosting capacity analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's something New Jersey is, is looking at and what your thoughts are on that yeah question. that 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 whole area of automation would probably fall under our work group six that i talked about you know that would also include clustering and there's it's it's how do you logically assemble and then process it and then how do you integrate as much and automate as much span of that as possible so very complex topic but potential big payoff for that but uh, good question thanks thank you Well, thank you so much, Alex, Paul, and in her absence, Lisa, for this great presentation and moderation. We really appreciate it. As I mentioned in the chat, we will make the slides and recording available. Um, I also put a couple of links in the chat if anybody would like more information on the New York NASIO Distributed Energy Resource Integration and Compensation Initiative. Uh, there's a link to the website. Um, if you would like to sign up for, for news on the initiative, my colleague, Kelsey Jones, will put her email and Sarah Fitzpatrick's email in the chat. Uh, NASIO published also a paper on considerations in evaluating ADMS and DERMS in 2022, for those of you who are interested. And then um, a quick announcement that we will also have a summary paper coming out soon um, on some reports that were done um, by um, think tanks um, and other organizations on uh, FERC Order 2222 and uh, some uh, considerations for state decision makers. So stay tuned for that. And with that, again, thank you to our speakers, to the Department of Energy, and all of you for attending. Kirsten, uh, one last thing. I I mistyped the uh, URL, but in the chat is njcleanenergy.com forward slash gridmod. You can access everything through there or the link to the public server for that. So for New Jersey's gridmod program. Awesome. Appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.